Previously on 30 for 30. I didn't know that Brian Buckle had ended up quitting the team. And next thing you know, I, I was on an Islanders jersey. I did not kick him out. I did not force him out. That was a great ending. You're putting a bad situation. I want to hear from you, actually. I, I, I got him. I got him. How are you feeling, James? I dug out of a hole. I got what I did. Tune his own horn, but I, I we like it. We like it. warnings. I think that's it. With the departure of their captain and the arrival of a new season, it was up to new captain Max Schwartz to right the ship in time. So that was tough, um, inheriting a team that just lost its leader. Um, I had the, the pleasure and the curse of having to rebuild it. Um, and the first thing I did was promote John King, who was with us in the postseason games, with us uh, during the Islander game, the regular season, promote him to a full-time member. And the original plan was um, to have me, James, and John play in the field and convert Dylan to a PO um, due to his struggles at the plate in the first season. But for Dylan, the departure of Brian Buckle was a lot for him. So much so that he had to leave the Sailors in solidarity, in one way or another. So, Dylan's retirement, unretirement, Tom Brady fiasco, you know. Yeah, I mean, it was really all Max's fault. Um, there's really no one else to point blame to. I mean, after his actions that led to our manager slash captain, Brian Buckle, leaving, I mean, just as a as a loyal teammate, I had to back him up in that um, and leave also uh, because I just don't want to be around, you know, those uh, those types of people that are almost uh, parasitical to your way of wiffle ball. And then he decided to retire, unretire. I don't remember if he retired and unretired again, but then he joined the, the Princes, right? Princes. And, um, you know, ever since then, he's been a pretty good part of the league and a good lefty hitter, except for this season, but. So uh, after season one, uh, you know, the Brook Hill Dolphins were kind of a disaster of a team. Uh, Preston CB left in free agency uh, and no one else really wanted to be on that team. Tino Lobozo retired. Uh, Reiner never showed up to a game. Sharp showed up to one, I think. So like just, they, the tensions were high on that team. They all kind of just separated, they disbanded. So Nick Handelores, Finn Giacomo, and John Colonius all signed with my, me and Doyle and Christian on the Jersey Juicers. Um, so we only had three teams in the league. It was just the Sailors, the Islanders, and the Jersey Juicers, which were the Cavs, but we rebranded. Um, so I decided that our league could not have three teams. So I'd, uh, I removed myself from the group chat. I said, sorry guys, I, I gotta do what's best for the league. I made an expansion team, the Egyptian Princes. I signed whoever was on the waivers. First person I texted was Dylan, because I knew that he was, he left the, the Sailors about a week earlier or something. In the end of it all, um, I was really just trying to make a better connection with the commissioner, James Reiner, um, with this Princes sign. Dylan was one of my favorite teammates on that team, you know, put a lot of heart into the game. He had a good season. I mean, the Egyptian princes, I thought the name was pretty cool in itself. Uh, we had the likes of Remy on our team, Reiner, Vincent, the freight train Rizzi. And I mean, with a team like that, I like, guess it's hard to beat. Um, obviously, that came untrue uh, when the season actually happened. However, um, I got a great payout for that year. And I got to thank Reiner for that. So thank you, Reiner. So the Sailors were once again a trio. And, um, you know, everyone really had a home. There was no one really to, no one to get, nobody really in free agency yet. Preston CB hadn't hit the market. Um, so I was tasked with, well, I have to find somebody that's not in the league. And I wanted to do something that hadn't been seen yet before. I wanted to make ripples in the league. I wanted to bring in somebody that would change the league. That would be as groundbreaking as the Sailors as a team will one, be, uh, one day be because 
you know, it embodies sort of our values as a franchise. And so I called up my good friend, Devin Cetaria. Uh, when I was approached about coming into the league, I mean, I was just excited. You know, I saw, I knew what the league was about. Um, I didn't know anything else though. I didn't know who was on my team. I didn't know who was on the other team. Um, I just wanted to be a part of it. We can all agree that bringing Devin into this league was one of the greatest decisions we ever made. He's been one of the best hitters, one of the best pitchers. Following the signing of Devin Cetaria, the Sailors were confident in their new roster to take them through the playoffs. But the roster would once again find itself incomplete, not due to losing a star player from their team, but from a team losing its star player to free agency, Preston Seepy. <laughs> So we had our full roster, we had it rounded out. Um, I was with guys I was really excited to be playing with. Um, but then news broke and we found out that Preston Seepi, one of the league's greatest hitters, had hit the market. He declared his free agency and he would not be re-signing with his team. And I pulled out all the stops. Well, you know, Brook Hill, I mean, my first experience with the league, I was uh, I was a little happy. You know, we didn't, we didn't want to play our playoff game. I was, uh, it was, I don't know, it was an interesting year. The thing about uh, Preston CP though, you're not just getting the hitter. I mean, we never got the hitter. He hit 176 on our team, but um, I mean, you're not just getting the hitter, you're getting the guy wearing the jersey, you're getting the person, you're getting the human being that Preston is, the guy that's always there to pick you up when you're down, to cheer your team on and push you over that finish line. And so I was gonna do everything in my power to acquire him in free agency. I think I wanted to change the pace, new, new scenery. So I was really looking for um I was looking for money you know I I just had a new family going I was uh just got two kids in private school I I wanted to put money on the table put food on the table so I had to sign with the uh, the sailors offered me the super duper pooper max deal first of the league and maybe the highest paid player in the league I uh I was happy but many many of my uh, Watchung faithful were disappointed in me for uh, switching sides but in the end it uh, it worked out for me. And so Preston was very transparent about the whole process as he had to be. Um, I got to speak right to him. I got to, you know, leap over the agent and have to deal with the middleman. And I got wind that uh, Jake had offered him uh, a super duper contract. And he said, you know, I'm leaning towards it. My home team, I'm from Wachung, he's from Wachung. But I love these guys that you got. I like the direction you turned the team in. What do you got for me? So I offered him the first and ever only super duper pooper max deal contract just to get him on our roster and he took it and Preston CB became the first player in league history um, to cross towns honestly I did think I was gonna land Preston CB I had been texting him I thought it was like a whole joke I thought the sailors talk was just like him just trying to be funny when it actually happened I mean I think I think it was just a it was just he just backstabbed all of Watchung, in my opinion. He just he kind of just, I don't know what to even say. I mean, he he, heart, he made us all heartbroken. He he went behind his behind his friends' backs. You know, he went to join a team of kids he barely even knew just because he thought it had a better chance of winning, which I don't even agree with. Um, I, I credit Preston CP with ushering in the era of interleague play. Jake, you know, he you could tell he had some fire for the league. He was, he was very... Uh, Passionate about, passionate about his about his creation, and he wanted to, wanted to win a championship team. But you know, I mean, of course, you can't let Jake win a championship. So I had to go with Max because you know he had the more uh, more professional style. You know, he's you know he's experienced. He was a new new guy, but I knew he was on the right track to uh, getting some future success in the league. You know, I just I didn't really understand it at the time. I mean, he got his ring, so good for him. But I don't know, Preston wasn't really worth it. So Max bringing in Devin Suteria in the, the, and also the first free agent signing of Preston ZP. It was honestly big for us. Makes him pretty much the greatest GM of all time in this league because he put together a team of superstars before anyone knew that they were actually good at wiffle ball. It obviously added two, two players we know could swing a bat, obviously being actual baseball players. Thus, with the arrival of Preston Seepi, the Sailors were ready to take on yet another hard-fought regular season. I think the one good thing about the Sailors is that, you know, we, we cared about how we performed, we cared about how we looked, but at the end of the day, it was a team that mattered. It was a team that 
came first and we were doing anything that was in our power to help the team because we knew the ultimate goal, it wasn't MVP, it wasn't Cy Young, it wasn't any of that, it was a World Series. It was to prove that we belong as a franchise and to erase the stigma that followed us around in the first season and into the second season. I'm not gonna, not gonna name names, but there were some pretty bad teams that season. A couple that were on my bottom five list in the podcast, if you watch that. Again, not going to name names, but we know who's who. Uh, the Islanders and the Sailors are the elite of the elite, I think. And that's what it came down to, ultimately. But once again, the Sailors did not find their season to go off without a hitch, as Preston had found it difficult adjusting to life in Silly, bleeding into his performance on the field. That season was... Uh... Season was something, you know. I had to uh, deal with the... A lot of boos, a lot of jeers from the crowd. They were very frustrated with my uh, on-field play. They, they didn't feel like I deserved a big contract. You know, whenever you see a player sign a max contract, a huge deal, they're slow. They're slow to play to the contract. You always have fans and more loudly opponents saying, you know, what did you do to deserve this? Why do you have this deal? And they're rooting against you. And you have people rooting against you trying to take you down. It's very, very hard to perform. I think Preston handled the pressure really well. Um, all said and done. You know, I I had to just fight through it. Coming coming with a smile every day. You know, didn't matter what Jake, Jake Zakoff was playing was saying and uh, continues to say, actually. But, you know, I think, I think it, uh, I think it was important for me. Because, you know, Success isn't given, it's earned. So, uh, you know, I had to go through my uh, trials, my tribulations to uh, attain success in this league. And uh, I think at the end of the day, it may be a better player. But if losing the confidence of the league and his fans was not hard enough for Preston, losing the confidence of his manager would be. Many people like to claim that the season two Sailors weren't the same thing as the season one Sailors. And sure, they were different players, but it was still the Sailors because yet again, we somehow found ourselves embroiled in a scandal. I remember when Jake Zakov announced he was signing a player outside of the league, similar to how I signed Devin, but you know, not as monumental, um, where he signed a player named Vincent Rizzo. Vinny never played in the league season one, but he was very interested in playing in season two. So I instantly texted him. I knew, I knew he would want to play, so he instantly agreed to play with me. I think he was literally the first person to respond. And for anyone who knows Vincent Rizzi, that you know, as he'd seen him pick up a bat, you would think that he was an incredible player. The man's an incredible athlete, extremely fast, jumps very high, he does it all. Great basketball player too, from what I hear. So we didn't know, and you know, Preston was struggling at the plate. So I hear Rizzi's getting signed, and I made the mistake of not betting on my players. Yeah, and then when Max offered me Rizzi for CPI, I can't remember exactly why, to be honest, but Maybe it's because of Preston's poor season. Um, but yeah, I, I believe I declined that trade. I mean, Vinny was one of my guys, Preston backstabbed us. I would never go for a backstabber. I mean, I understood it at the time. It was it was, it was understandable, especially when you're looking at it from a, uh, a general manager's perspective. You're, you're trying to swap a guy who's not contributing to the team and uh, not helping them win games for a guy who's uh, had a very, uh, had a, had a good, I was having a good run so far. I regretted it as soon as the news broke, as soon as the screenshot hit the group chat. And um, I, I knew regret wasn't enough. I knew apology was enough. So I prepared a statement. I released the statement from my press office. And just to show how much I cared, I removed myself from the line of card, focused on managing, and again, put the team ahead of myself. Um, in a way that I try to teach my players to do. And because I didn't live up to that promise, um, in that moment, I tried to rectify that issue. When I saw, you know, that we were trying to trade one of our own for a player who, quite frankly, I didn't think was up to Preston's level at the time, or even anywhere even close, uh, I was a little shocked. And, you know, obviously, like I said, I wasn't there for the series where Max pulled himself. But I remember seeing the whole thing go down in our group chat and I was just thinking like, wow, is this what I signed up for? And I had to question my loyalty for a second. Like, is this the team that I want representing me? But, you know, the self, it was at the end of the day, a selfless move, you know, and that's just the type of person Max was. That's the type of person we all sailors were is that we wanted to stay together 
but at the same time, we had to do what was best for the team. You know, this 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 is when I gained a, an immense respect for uh, Max Schwartz as a player and manager. You know, it it takes a lot of guts to call your own number, but someone said it even takes more guts to uh, not call your own number. It it was very it was a uh, I was actually very surprised because you know Max was being more of a part of the team than I was, especially at the dish. My th first thoughts to Max pulling himself from the lineup in our regular season series in season two. Um, he showed up in a tie, pulled himself out of the lineup. That is a great manager. At the time, it seemed like the right thing to do because of what he was trying to do and breaking up the team. I thought it was kind of corny, to be honest. I mean, he, he took himself out to try to show that he was like trying to be a leader and stand up as a captain and prove everyone wrong, that he was a selfish captain. But then the next game, he put himself batting third above the likes of people, I believe, like James Hughes. After finding their footing as a new team in the second regular season, the Sailors were ready to take on the postseason again, this time under brighter lights and greater scrutiny. So the league started getting more structured in season two, and we had the Instagram account going, and we had people really taking a vested interest in the league, not just within the league, but from outside. And we were starting to grow a fan base, and it's easy to control a narrative when you have power and when three teams hate your team's guts it's very easy to turn a whole fan base against them so we started seeing things like sink the ship trend on twitter um people coming in with princes signs and islander signs to school but not wanting the sailors to win that comment section was going a little crazy i think ryan had to do something about it we did do comments for a while before it was just getting started, this is where the, it took off. Uh, we had people even come to the game that weren't in the league for the first time. Oh my god, but this game was something. I remember right after school, Scotty, Phillips Field. We got we got we got all the chicks in the stands, all all the all the lovely ladies in Watching Hills coming to watch us play some wiffle ball. Uh, I remember we had a big crowd for that game. I remember the lights were shining pretty bright. <laughs> Wasn't that the game where like all the girls went? <laughs> Enjoy. The playoffs in the league used to be one six-inning game, and there's a six-inning total limit for the pitchers. So they were trying to save Jake um, in the event they make the World Series because he was their ace. Um, little they know, Jake doesn't go to World Series. Going to the beginning of that game, we started off amazing. We had everyone hit a home run. It was the bats were popping, and we just raked off a Christian. We had a fan. We had fans rooting us on, cheering for us while we racked up the score. It got so bad, the fans left in the first inning and thought it was over. And it might as well have been. Because then Rizzy came in, we just raked off of him too. Yes, Christian pitching first. It was like Obama's immigration policy. Everybody's going through here. And nobody's getting stopped. Walks galore. It was like it was like a gosh darn 5K out there. I remember I hit a home run in my first at bat. Felt pretty good. Hit a home run in my second at bat. Felt pretty good. We sucked. I mean, we lost that game so bad. It was probably one of the worst games. It might be, it might be the worst playoff game in wiffle ball history. We then had to move fields from behind Scotty onto Scotty because uh, Mr. Matthew Boglovsky was running a uh, volleyball camp. I had an appointment after the game, though, supposed to be after the game, but it ended up coming down to the fact that we were in the last inning and I had to leave early. When Max checked himself in, I thought it was game over. We were going to win. You know, he checked himself in. I instantly got a huge boost of confidence at the plate. I was not there. I was visiting University of Georgia, which ultimately decided they didn't want me, but fuck them. Um, and I watched the game on Instagram Live. This was before we had highlight videos. And basically, I'm taking my tour around campus, and I see Max coming into the game in a close game, and I'm like, oh, fuck. Schwartz called his own number at doing the opposite of what he did in the regular season. And he uh, he shut the game out with a little bit of luck in the uh, from uh, from parents at the uh, at the at the track there. I got to the plate. I hit a ball that I thought should have been gone. Ethan, Ethan robbed it, saved their season, saved Max's legacy, potentially. I remember Jake came up with a chance to win. I robbed the homer like I was David Ortiz or Michael B. Jordan because he's cool, and I'm cool, and Jake sucks. Ultimately, it worked out because we won, and Ethan Parrott's 
rob jake's ache off of a home run it, it, it honestly reminded me of a of a movie rookie of the year-esque it was just the end of the game it was just perfect and team got together you know of course jake lost it's always a bonus playoff max is a real thing you know it's time we accept that given the history and that legend was born that day so sometimes things just work out the way they do it's that's that that's if in the words of joe tomarco that's baseball uh you know you never know how things are gonna go and you ever never know what guy's gonna have on any given day but uh you gotta respect it for him calling his own number you know the score says it's a close game but it really was not that close it was quite a cakewalk to the finals for the first time in the franchise's history the sailors are headed to the world series but on the other side of the diamond proved to be their greatest rival the 21 and 0 ief islanders and the lights only got brighter from there right i mean there was a lot of drama uh, when we were building up to the World Series, and rightfully so. You know, the history that these two two teams had, even though I may have not been present for it, I knew all about it. And, you know, it was something that, as a loyalty thing to my teammates who were a part of that, um, you know, you want to win that game. You hear everyone talking about the record disparity, how the Islanders hadn't lost in who knows how long. And, um, you know, it's all part of the narrative, all stuff that, you know, we just tried to lock in and play our game, but, you know, we'd be lying if we said we weren't listening to it and it didn't fuel the fire. I, I certainly thought the Islanders were locked to win that championship, you know? I mean, I know I thought it, my whole team thought it. I think the whole universe thought we were locked to win that uh, that game. You know, we were going to the game 21 and 0. Um, like, yeah, like I said, we uh, we beat up on that team the season prior, the uh, and that season especially. Um, we knew how to take care of business and uh, I felt no pressure. I thought we were really gonna win that game. So, it's lunchtime, the, the bickering starts, the trash talk, everyone's taking the Islanders in this World Series. It's Islanders Sailors. On paper, they have every single stat better than ours. Uh, the Islanders were 21 wins deep, zero losses. Um, it felt like that game was ours to win. Lunchtime, it was all trash talk on both sides. Everyone had the Islanders for a walk. The, the Instagram post showed the, the stats of each. There were, there were comments below. What's the, what's the line for the game? What's, what's the over under? Um, like people would say Islanders minus five and a half. I took that personally. I know Devin took that personally. I know Mac took that personally. I know James took that personally. I know Preston took that personally. I know we were upset as a team being going in there and everyone writing us off before a single pitch was thrown. With the entire world against them, the Sailors took the field on a cold October morning to try and prove everyone wrong and do the impossible. Take home a World Series trophy. I mean, if, if I had to describe the World Series in one word, I mean, it'd just be greatness. You know, I mean, if I had to describe it in two words, I mean, it's like peak wiffle ball. And if I had to describe it in three words, it's must-see TV. You know, I, I could go on for hours. So the season two World Series between the Sailors and the Islanders, I remember it being a very cold October day. Uh, Trenton Standard and Kevin Haynes showed up to support the Sailors. They were freezing their balls off in the bleachers. So one morning, you know, it's a normal morning in October, and I got allergies, but I, I woke up this morning, it, it was not allergies, it was more than that. I woke up, I remember I was sweating, uh, which I don't normally do when I sleep, sometimes not normally. Throat was hurting, head was hurting, and I'm like, I gotta get a glass of water, see what's going on. I remember I take one step out of bed, and I'm, boom, I collapse on the ground. And I was like, this is not good, because I got a game to play. Max was deathly ill, and he had himself a Michael Jordan flu game, hitting two homers. You know, all the Robitussin in the world couldn't have made me feel 100%, but it got me to the game in in almost one piece. And it wasn't easy to run. It wasn't easy to perform uh, in the same way that I'm accustomed to attempting to perform. But I think it was quite a great performance by myself, all things considered, when I put up incredible numbers, really. I mean, a couple of home runs, one off of uh, the greatest ever do it, Ryan Chicozzi in that game, um, all while all while struggling to, you know, stand on my own two feet. 
that was a crazy game. I remember a uh, super high scoring game, a lot of craziness involved, a lot of a uh, lot of shenanigans. Uh, it's a day I'd like to forget, but it's a day that will live in infamy. You know, it's something I want to block out of my mind, but I remember it clear as day. I remember getting to that field, like I said, no pressure, all the confidence in the world. I know I had Trey for like three innings. Uh, I just needed three decent ones out of David. They could beat up on us, I thought, but I mean, I know we had the bats to come back, so it wasn't that big of a deal. Um, we get to that field, and that first inning just, it couldn't have gotten worse. I remember in the World Series, we uh, went down early. I remember, you know, our, our pitching and our defense did not really play to the level we expected. We went down early. I think it was like 20 to nothing after the first inning. Um, remember we got the bats going, but it was too little too late. David started out for us because I didn't have all my innings and he struggled. That, that's, that's the biggest part of that game. So is Islander again. Shit was a fucking shit show. David Figueroa started the game through atrocious. Honestly, one of the worst starts to a World Series you could be as a pitcher. It's all my fault. I'll take full responsibility for that loss. I was the one pitching. I threw maybe, actually not maybe, I did throw a lot of fucking balls. And each inning we kept piling on runs. And we kept putting on run after run after run until we put up a 30 piece on the Islanders. They couldn't stop us. Even when I came in, I gave up a few home runs. I remember John King hit a long home run down the left field line. And that really put a damper on our mood and we couldn't come back from that at all. I remember myself having a few RBIs. Preston finally decided to hit. And basically everyone in our lineup hit as we put up 30 runs. Uh, the bats could have been better. I mean, we put up 24, but it was mostly walks. I remember I had a couple home runs. I was I was happy with my performance, but the loss still stung. I mean, we all just could have played better as a team, more cohesively, and tried to try to keep a high morale. But losses was loss. I struggled at the plate. I remember striking out to Preston CP on a like a push ball. Uh, I struck out looking, and then Max Schwartz came to close the game, in, and that was just the nail in the coffin for us. A guy who never really pitched that whole season ended up closing out a World Series game and winning his first title against us. And that one really hurt. Trey didn't have his best performance, you know, not a home run, which is very unusual for him. Let up nine runs. It's just not a sight you like to see, man. You know, I didn't come up big for the team and it, it haunts me to this day. I think if I played to where I could have, we would have had a shot. Um, obviously, I wasn't in the best circumstances with the lead that we had to come back from. Um, but that's no excuse. You know, when you don't hit well at the plate, you don't pitch well, and you just were, I was pretty much a non-factor for that, for that game. And um, I think it's really fair to say that my failure to perform is what caused us to lose that game. Sailors pulled off the upset. I mean, if you, there's a post on the Instagram about it, about the team stats compared and Islanders favored in every single category, and the Sailors still pulled it off. So I give him credit. Devin really showed out that series in the entire playoffs, to be honest. He won World Series MVP. I thought he deserved it. Um, I think everyone on the team just played well in the playoffs. I mean, got to give him credit. Got to give credit where credit's due. I mean, Islanders probably would have loved to have two undefeated seasons in a row, but they got spoiled. It's like the, the Giants versus the Patriots back in the day. And it did get close. It did get really close towards the end. But we held on. We held on better than we held on the playoff game. And, I mean, we did something that nobody thought we could ever do. Just win a World Series. Everyone loves an underdog story. Now, I hate Philly, but Philly being the Patriots, underdog story. USA being Russia, 1980. Huge underdog story. Islanders, sailors, put it up there. It really just, really just stings, you know? Uh, that being the first loss, I mean, I would have rather to be literally anyone else. I, I promise you that. Any other team except for these damn sailors, man. Um, yeah, I, I really would say it hurt the most losing against them. We were perfect. And the trash talk ensued. Everyone 
after that, we want a rematch, we want a rematch. Why? The game decided the game, okay? That was the matchup. You guys lost. There's no rematch. You don't get two, two tries. You get one. Uh, I mean, I remember that like people were calling it a Mickey Mouse ring. People were calling it, you know, undeserved. And my question to that is, you know, like how, you know, why, um, what is probably the better term to use? Because you know we won fair and square. We we fought the team that you know had the Goliath of this league as the mere David. And people don't always like to see an underdog story. Is what that showed me. You know, I mean, the cliche is that you know people love the underdog. But you know what, like. Um, I think, I think, uh, you know, we definitely proved ourselves as a, as definitely as a, as a, as T as a team and more players, because I remember after that season, I got, a, a, someone said, I don't know, I got, I got a mixed bag myself. Cause you know, I did, did have a crappy, uh, regular season hitting 176. And I, I, uh, I've heard about that a few times, but then I, uh, then I also gained some respect for winning world series. I know John King gained more respect in the league. I mean, I mean, he did already have a lot. He was in fact, the inventor of football. So guy the guy who's been there around for a long time. James Hughes, another big guy. Uh, Max Schwartz made him made himself his name as a uh, player coach. You know, uh, only only got to do it before that is uh, Ty Cobb. But whatever it is, you know that that was a deserved chip, and it should be seen as such, in my opinion. If the league, at that point, was able to have one wish, in the first two seasons, at any point, it was for the Sailors to no longer be in the league. We were always hated. We were always looked at differently than everybody else. We were Rudolph um, to the other reindeer of the league. And I think when we won the World Series, when we overcame the odds, people didn't like that. They were very unhappy about that. And it rubbed people the wrong way. And I think they saw if we could overcome the odds and defeat the Islanders, the greatest team in history, the only team to never lose a regular season game across two seasons that we were in for a good season three, that we were going to come back and do what the Islanders couldn't do and win two in a row. And the commissioner didn't like that. He didn't like that one bit. And so for season three, for the first time since season one, he instituted a redraft to break up the sailors, to disband them, and to make the league's wish, their one and only wish, come true which was no longer to have to worry about a team so powerful as the Sailors. You know, I just think people just wanted change. I think they were, t I think they thought the teams were very unfair. Uh, people wanted to play with different people. Sailors and the Islanders rosters were just much better than the other two teams, so. Um, after the Sailors won that World Series, World Series number two, um, we kind of changed up the league for the better, I feel. We redrafted. Obviously, that Sailors team got split up because they all proved they were really good players. Uh, you can't fault you can't fault Schwartz for this one. He just he just uh, drafted smarter than everybody else. Like it was it was similar to Moneyball. It was his strategy basically was why don't we just take all the people who play baseball at the high school and just put them on a wiffle ball team? And essentially that worked. There was no really Moneyball involved. There wasn't you know we wasn't wasn't making the signing deals from the from the Shanghai Sharks. You know these were these were a lot of big name guys just kind of happened to be together on one team and uh it was a lot of big personalities but we were able to make it work out in the end the sailors of old from when i was there i think really represented what the league was about it was about having fun with your friends you know you think back to corking the bat and throwing the ephus pitches and drawing the cursive sailor onto my white t-shirt it's just something that i've never really felt again throughout the rest of the league. When I hear the name, the Silly Sailors, I remember that first time when I grabbed my dad's white t-shirt out of his drawer because I didn't have one of my own. And I drew on with the blue marker, the cursive Sailors logo with the German flag in the bottom right Belgian corner. Flag. Belgian flag in the bottom right corner with my number and I think Jimmy Schitt's on the back of the jersey. Um, I still have that jersey hanging in my closet and it also made its way to college with me and hung in my closet there and will move into my apartment this year as well. You know, the Sailors is a, a name that rings true to this league. You can't tell the story of this WH Wiffleball League without them. Um, obviously, season one, they were one of the worst teams in the league. 
season two they come back and they win a championship you know it's a, it's a true comeback story not only did the sailors do things that no one thought we could do we did things that no one thought anyone could do yeah i mean the sailors like you know without a doubt no matter what their history is i mean you gotta give them credit uh, credit i mean they're they're in the league for multiple seasons you don't see that anymore do you when I hear the word sailors, I mean, all I can think about is just, I don't know, there's a lot of personality, a lot of drama, you know, the history of the team, just a lot of antics, a lot of, you know, I don't know. They have they have made a big impact on the league. I mean, since the sailors, I mean, they do bat checks every game. And for what? Because some kid left a bat at home plate and it happened to be court. I mean, come on. It's Bush League. I know this is the point where I'm supposed to be like, oh, sailors were great, all that, and excuse my language, but I'm not going to spew some bullshit to you. Uh, anytime I hear the word sailor, even outside of the football, it just brings a sting into my heart. The sailors were my first home. They were, they meant everything to me. There, there were a couple guys who, who just wanted to have fun playing the game. I hate that organization. Uh, I hate what they stand for. I hate everything about them. Um, you know, shouldn't have won. I wouldn't even say tainted my legacy, but it would have looked a hell of a lot greater if I had that third ring. And when I say this, I say with my whole heart, the Sailors will forever be known, and I mean forever, be known as the biggest wound this football league has and will ever see. There's a lot of controversy that's brewed since me and Brian split ways following the playoff game. But, you know, when you look at it in a different way, when you look back on it and see, well, what happened after, it worked out for everybody. The team that Brian founded, that same ragtag group that me, Brian, Dylan were once part of, where we found our beginning in this league, we won the World Series. I got a ring. And when Brian left in season one, he got his ring. And more, impart more importantly, when you look back on it, Jake lost two rings. He net lost two rings. Brian got the hit off him in season one. And we took him down in season two when he was having a Cy Young season. Max was my pick for the greatest manager of all time. He had made the perfect team the perfect team between fun, hard work, and talent. That's all you need to win a World Series. We really improved the way we do free agency. If people want to play, they have to they have to tell us before the season. They can't just join a team mid-season and create a super team. Sailors were pretty good. We overcame the Islanders. They weren't much. Trey sucks. Trey always sells in the playoffs, so not much to say about that. I mean. I don't even think I was there, but if I was, I was rooting for the team. Uh, Devin carries, he's a tripod. Yeah, Max is a great owner. Jake could use some work. Trey's all right. You look at guys, you look at Phil Jackson, Joe Torrey, Bill Belichick. You're telling me they didn't make mistakes? Telling me they'd have no regrets? Of course, everyone makes mistakes. But when you look at what we accomplished, when you look at what happened under my 10 years manager, we won the World Series. We did it. We accomplished what we set out to do. And if you want to change some things that did along the way, who knows that's the destination that we reach. I personally, I may have made mistakes. I may have done some, some, done some things wrong, may do some things differently in the future, but I'm very happy with the way things turned out. And I have no regrets on that season as a whole or the way anything happened. It was a team that just loved each other. It's a team that, you know, if you have two players today on the same team who are on that team, they automatically have a connection because of the memories they shared and the legacies that that one singular night, day, morning in October left. Now this team is the, the one of the most, if not the most influential team in history. I mean, people say the Islanders were the uh, best team to ever do it, season one. But, uh, I mean, you got to ask yourself, who, who took them down season two? I mean, it was it was incredible. It was just the whole season. It was a great run from some great guys, some 
It's a lot of fun. Ups, we had our ups and downs, but it worked out, and we got ourselves a ring. It, it, the, the, the respect that also you gain for being on the sale is such a, such a well, well established franchise. You know, there was a bit of turmoil, manager turnover last season with uh, the, uh, the incident with uh, Max Schwartz and Brian Buckle, but the respect that we gain, it, it, it's incredible, especially winning a ring, have, being around a lot of big name guys, get a lot of big expo exposure. You know, we also were in some huge games that uh, helped skyrocket our uh, popularity and respect in the league. But uh, I wouldn't trade my time on the sales for anything, and uh, thanks, I'm thankful for being a part of it. I, I've been on quite a few teams in my tenure. I'm sure, you know, God willing, as long as injuries don't sideline me, I'll be on many more teams to come. But at the end of the day, when I look back, when people will say, when they stumble across the Instagram, when they stumble across the YouTube, when my kids ask me, Dad, what team were you on? I was a sailor.